This is a podcast about facing your inner demons and becoming the hero you need to be. In this series, I address the topic of how abuse, trauma, and fear can affect us. I do this from the viewpoint of someone that actually went through it. Furthermore, I talk about how to start the process of becoming free from the prison of the soul that we are often trapped in after our abuses. We'll take a look at how those transgressions can affect us in our daily life, and how they automatically reprogram our code to set us up for defeat. I'm not a doctor or a therapist. I have no PhDs. I am, however, a survivor. And so are you. It's time to stop waiting for someone to come and save you. It's time to become the hero that you were meant to be and save yourself. I hope my story can help. Because my monsters are real, and they are trained how to kill. And there's no coming back, and they just laugh at how I feel. And these monsters can fight, and they'll never say die. There's no going back. If I get trapped, I'll never heal. Yeah, my monsters are real. Shine down. There's something about the humidity in the South that can make you just want to give up. You know, it's the kind of heat that just permeates everything and even embeds itself into the soul, if you believe in that sort of thing. I spent a massive portion of my life in the sweltering heat and dense humidity of the South. Now, those countless days of toiling in the sun and the heat underneath the watchful eyes of all those around me taught me a few things that I will never forget. It taught me that I was worthless. It taught me that I wasn't fit to exist. I learned that I wasn't even worth the air I was breathing, let alone the name I was given. It further instilled in me that I wasn't going to amount to anything, that I was a waste of flesh, and my only reason for living was that my captors hadn't taken my life away yet. For 15 years, I was reminded of how horrible I was. In those 15 years, I learned to hate, hate myself and hate everything around me. My programming was hard-coded into my psyche, and I was destined to follow a path of self-destruction that would lead to my ultimate downfall, and I was going to take everyone I considered close down with me. Today, however, as of the time of this recording, I can safely say that my imminent failure was a prophecy that never came to fruition. I am a highly intelligent human being with a list of skills ranging close to the hundreds mark. I am an accomplished author and professional in many fields. I have a wife and a daughter that I adore, and we have a very healthy and balanced relationship with one another, and our friends and family hold me in high regards. Getting from there to here wasn't easy though. This was perhaps one of the greatest struggles of my life. I battled this poor programming that was installed into my OS, my operating system, for almost 30 years. I'm only here because I found a way to rewrite my code. I saw a very unique way to change the course of my life by facing the bad programming installed in me and making the conscious choice to delete that code and install new code. I am here, sitting in front of this microphone, because I want to give you the ability to do the same. You no doubt turned on this podcast based on a review, or a recommendation, or you found the cover interesting. Either way, you are listening to this because you believe there is something not quite right about yourself, and you are looking for some kind of change. In order for you to understand how my process works and how I got from there to here, it's important for you to understand the starting point, where this reprogramming knowledge came from and why I brought it into existence. Fasten your seatbelts, kiddos. This first episode is a bit of a rough ride. We're going to start at my humble beginnings. I was born in a small hospital in Florida to my mother and my biological father. 
I have no real idea how long we were there in Florida. Maybe a few months. Shortly thereafter, I was relocated to a suburb just outside of Alabama's biggest city of Birmingham. Those first few years of existence are gone, lost to the ever-fleeting memory of a still-developing brain. I couldn't tell you exactly what happened to my mother and father's relationship. I actually have no memories of him being there. My memories didn't actually begin to form until after he had been gone for several years. As my memories began to form and become lasting passages in the neurons of my brain, they were infused with violence, vulgarity, abuse, oppression, vile and deformed concepts of what was right and wrong, and ultimately, my own self-worth. My mother had formed a relationship with a man that was to raise me as my father. All of the violence and other despicable things that happened to me were a result of that union between the two of them. No one could have possibly known that their relationship would have such lasting impact on so many people. It's funny that sometimes it takes the worst in people to bring out the best. Let's break down exactly what happened, shall we? This next part gets a bit graphic and can be somewhat cringeworthy. So this is your trigger warning. Listen on at your own risk. I was the full-on victim of four of the five major forms of abuse. Physical, mental, emotional, and verbal. Each of these four abuses was shoved down my throat on a daily basis. And it was a good day if I only got three of them. The relationship between my mother and stepfather was difficult for all of us. She was deeply wounded by my biological father and considered us. I had a sibling and they will not be discussed in this podcast. She considered us a permanent scar that she was forced to look at every day. She saw me as a full-time cause of her unhappiness and didn't even consider me to be human. She believed that I was some sort of unfair punishment that she was shackled with, a demon that was there to ruin her life. Back then, we didn't have much of a national conversation about mental health. I always knew she was quote-unquote crazy, but there were no terms available to a mind as young as mine to help define the issue. I believe that she was absolutely bipolar and had some kind of PTSD from her failed marriage and broken home that triggered incredible fits of rage and anger. But the worst part was there was probably more going on there than any of us knew. My stepfather wasn't much better. He joined my mother at an early age and had a limited education. He had grown up in a mechanic shop with an abusive father himself. He was a wizard with mechanical things, but had the mental and emotional capacity of a giant bag of dicks. Meaning he wanted what he wanted and everyone else around him was fucked until he got it. There was no doubt some mental and emotional scars that he was dealing with on a full-time basis as well. The pairing of my mother and my stepfather was a recipe for disaster on every level. I was left to be the person that bore the brunt of that catastrophe. I could literally fill an entire book with the specific shit that they did to me. However, I won't waste my time or my words with those specific details. I will, however, tell you the overall situation as it pertains to my programming. My daily life consisted of fear. Fear of what the day would bring. I was rarely called by my name. I was always referred to as an idiot, a piece of shit, Wayne, my bio father's name, that was a special stab from my mother, dumbass, fuck up, mistake, etc. These names were quite often strung together in paragraphs that were repeated throughout the day, sometimes for hours, as I was forced to stand silent and motionless while they were being spewed at me. My mother was a vile perpetrator of these offenses. She would often go on epic rants that would only serve to further fuel her angered state the longer she shouted. She would be in my face shouting at me so loud I could feel the spit-laced words coming from her mouth in the form of sound waves on my skin. 
The tyrannical rants were always mixed with some form of physical violence. At any given moment, you could expect her to throw a punch, a slap, or some kind of strike based on what she was holding. I often had my head slammed into something, usually face first. As soon as the impact happened, I was expected to stand up, not cry or wince, and regain composure immediately. Now, we're talking about somebody that's not even 10 years old when this started. Now, keep in mind that this was not the episodes of full-blown abuse. No, these were just the verbally abusive, soul-crushing, gaslighting sessions that started the day. The good stuff required more of a warm-up. The verbal abuse from my stepfather was slightly varied. His everyday lingo involved never saying my name. Choose any number of profanities, and they could be inserted into the sentence rather than my name. The usual slanderous words were readily chosen, and then he had a specific nickname for me that I detested. I refused to even say that word. He would also revert to violence at a moment's notice. His favorite thing to do was to kick you with steel-toed boots on. Second after that was slamming you into things. Walls, cars, the ground, anything really. Keep in mind, all this I described thus far was simply the day-to-day. Most people wake up and have coffee, get the kids ready for school, and go about their day. They woke up, hated every portion of their life, chose violence and abuse, and went on with the business of administering that abuse to everyone around them, even the dogs. The hard days were really hard, and I do mean really hard. There are hundreds upon hundreds of days of violence and abuse stored in my head. Days that I will never forget. Days that I was lucky to walk away from. I don't even have enough fingers and toes to count the near-death experiences that I had. My mother and father were vile human beings at that point in their lives. My mother passed away about 20 years ago, and my stepfather kind of mellowed in his old age, but, you know, still there. They put me through absolute hell. For that, there is no forgiveness. However, this podcast isn't about forgiveness. It's about understanding. Understanding how these kinds of situations can install poor programming on us, and how that poor programming affects our perceptions of the world around us and how we interact with it. If we fast forward just five years from the end of that hell I described a few moments ago, I can show you how the poor programming was already having an effect on my entire world. The Effects of Their Shit Programming I like to break down how programming guides us through life into five categories. Now, keep these in mind, jot them down, I'll mention them several times. Those five categories are input, perception, processing, output, and reaction. These five categories are part of every single thing you do, and they exist in a constant loop that your brain is running over and over. Let me take a second and break down those categories for you real quick. Input. This is the information that is received, plain and simple. We have multiple ways we receive input, everything from our five senses to our emotions to our sensing the vibe in a room or our own inner monologue. We are in a constant state of input reception. There's always information coming into us from some place or source. This podcast is a source of information. You are currently getting input from the sound that is coming into your ears. Your perception. Now, this is a big one. This category is all about how the information we receive, the input that we get, is categorized. We're designed to process and evaluate if information is a threat to us or not. Sometimes we categorize things as pleasure, like food or sex. Other times, we see it as a threat to our safety, our way of life, like violence or a potential threat to our emotional well-being. 
We'll get more into this later on in the podcast series. Processing. What we choose to do with the information we have received, and how we perceived it. Processing. Now, this is about what we choose to do with the information we have received, and how we perceived it. Is this something that we're going to respond to? Is this a learning session that we need to store the knowledge from? Is it a fleeting moment that makes no difference in our existence? Is it a completely life-altering event that is going to completely fuck us? That's what the processing portion of your loop in your programming is all about. Now, next is the output, how we actually respond to that information. Do we respond with words, physical action, emotion, emotional reaction? What response comes from us after we perceive and process that information? Reaction. After we output, there is a physical change in the real world, as well as an internal reaction within ourselves. This category is all about how the output that we produced creates a change in the world, if any, and how we prepare for the next loop. That information goes through that loop, goes out into the world, and then we begin the next loop. First, whether it's feedback from the existing loop that we just went through, or it is a new loop we are going into. Let's talk about those five categories again. They are input, how the information comes into us. Perception, how we categorize the information that comes in. Processing, what we choose to do with the information we get. Output, how we actually respond to that information. And then reaction, what reaction does our response have on the world? How do we react from what we put out in the world and how does the world react from what we put out there? These five categories encompass, for the illustrative purposes of this podcast, how our programming works. Now, there have been exhaustive studies performed and countless books and papers written on this subject that will dive into the nuance of it all should you choose to go down that rabbit hole. But for the purposes of these episodes, we will be sticking with these five. My programming was completely fucked on so many levels in each of these categories that it would take me 15 years to figure out what the problem was and how I should go about fixing it. Let's start with input. I could only receive information from five physical senses. No information that made its way to me had any kind of depth to it whatsoever. It all came in as black and white. I didn't believe in anything, so nothing spiritual or emotional ever made its way into me. I simply didn't have the capacity to intake info in any other form other than those five senses. This was troublesome because it made me dreadfully unaware of any nuanced changes to the info that was coming in. Now, next, this lackluster information hit my perception filter. This is where everything got really screwy. While I had no depth on the input portion of myself, my perception was a swirling black hole of blame, self-doubt, emotional stupidity, fear, ignorance, possibly undiagnosed PTSD, trauma, and self-preservation. These concepts were all installed by my parents, and later the dipshits I went to school with, in various ways. The blame portion of my processing was set by example. No matter what my parents did to me, they always told me that it was my fault, that I was making them do this to me, as if I was forcing the abuse upon myself. Even if I could slip in a word edgewise during the beratement, I was gaslit anyways. So, in return, my still-developing mind took those experiences to mean the following. If it hurts me, it's your fault. And if it hurts you, it's your fault. Grown-ups are never wrong, and we get to assign blame to anyone that rubs us the wrong way. You should be able to foresee the future and always take into account what makes me happy? I know, I know, it's screwy, but that's what happened. Now, the self-doubt, however, served in direct opposition to that chunk of blame code. The decade and a half of direct insults slung at me all day, every day, told me that I wasn't even worth the air I was breathing. 
that I was way too stupid to even be receiving this info, let alone process it. I should just give up and let it prove how shitty and worthless I was. That lackluster self-worth turned into this. It doesn't matter what I think. They are right and I am wrong. Shut up and take it. If you stand up and speak your mind, you will be destroyed. After that, the information had to go through the emotional stupidity filter. Growing up in hate and violence like I did will instantly remove any other emotions from you. The only things that are left after that process happens is hatred, joy from freedom of hatred. You don't have hate at this exact moment, so it feels like happiness. Disgust, rage, and anger. That's it. Everything flows and circulates around hatred. Hatred of those out to get you, hatred of those that don't understand you, hatred of situation, hatred of those that have more, hatred of those that have less, because they have less and are still happier than you, hatred of those that won't help you, hatred of those that do help, hatred of everything. Now, you can look at our political discourse these days and you can see that that kind of mentality is everywhere. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, it's there. That hatred of anything that's not like you permeates everything you do. And when you grow up in that hatred, it literally becomes who you are. Now, when you look at the chunk of code that was written from that, it reads like this. Don't waste your time with this bullshit. You'll hate it anyway. It was probably put forth by something or someone you hate. Now, next up was the fear filter. This is probably one of the worst ones because it taps into your core programming of survival. Every day I went to sleep in fear and woke up in fear, having no idea which action, word, or even thought would ignite the fuse of the oppressive hate mongers that watched every second of my life, waiting for an opportunity to pounce and unleash their rage on me. I existed in a state of high alert. I can't even imagine how much cortisol was pumped into my body. It's even harder to process how much unused adrenaline sat in my system and stewed for hours after each and every assault. The fear that was programmed into me caused me to be fearful of everything. I was always playing out all the negative possibilities that could happen. That made one thing that brought me fear turn into a thousand things that brought me fear because I was afraid of the possibilities. Needless to say, I wasn't able to see the positive side of anything. That constant fear that was embedded into my code read like this. How is this going to hurt you? Fuck it, it will sting you somehow, stay away from it. Ignorance was always at play in the perception of any information that came into me. There were not one, but three different sources for this poor programming. Now let's start with geographical location. I was held hostage in the deep south. And when I say held hostage, I mean my mother, my father, they kept me pinned down there where it was just fucking stupid. In the south, stupid people rule the world, or at least that's what they believe. There is a large portion of the population there that believes they already know everything about any given subject to an expert level. They also believe that all life on Earth operates under the same rules and in the same social situations as they do. So what limited knowledge they have applies to everyone and everything. Now this has a lot to do with not leaving your hometown for the entirety of your life. Furthermore, any new information on a subject must meet a few criteria. It must fit their narrative. It must not challenge their ego. It must place blame it must absolve them of any wrongdoing, unless that can be translated into a Bubba's and Beer moment. It must not flow against the laws of common sense. That basically means that if a fifth grader can't understand the concept instantly, then it's bullshit and completely untrue. Lastly, those in select positions of power, preachers, pastors, your favorite politicians, memaws, pawpaws, and the random guy down the road for some reason, are responsible for delivering to you any information you need to know. If that new information ever violates one of the aforementioned criteria, that person is then othered and no longer knows anything at all. 
This form of thought is so invasive in that portion of the country that real, actual intelligence is insulted, discouraged, approached with hostile intent, and drowned out by the loud and ignorant voices and disbelief at the audacity of learning anything new. If you offer resistance to any of those aforementioned statements, they may just be talking about you. You should have a long look in the mirror. This was the dominant cultural wisdom in that part of the country. It permeated every aspect of life, and it was the driving force behind the second source of ignorance in my life, my parents. They openly embraced this Southern intelligence concept, but for them, nobody knew anything more than they did. The two of them each believed that they were the pinnacles of all knowledge in the known universe. Everyone else represented an assault on their intelligence. Didn't matter who you were, friend, family, scholar, scientist, doctor, preacher, teacher, etc. God himself could have come down from the clouds to teach them something new, and they would have run him off of their property. You can imagine how this played out to a child with a still developing brain. The two people that were the most vile were to also be revered for their supreme intelligence. Truth be told, they placed all of their knowledge into the common sense basket. Neither one of them knew much about anything. My stepdad could fix a car like no one else, but could barely spell, hardly read, and couldn't even write worth a shit. My mother touted her intelligence on a regular basis, but couldn't understand this simple concept that if you're vile to everyone, no one will like you. She openly believed that she was the smartest person she knew, but nothing could have been further from the truth. The final input for my ignorance filter was the education system. That's not to say the education system is broken, but it's fucking broken. I was one of the many that fell through the cracks at the junior high and high school level. I was suffering from massive amounts of abuse at home, and that made me socially awkward. The social awkwardness meant I wasn't popular, which meant I wasn't important to anyone. Principals, teachers, guidance counselors, etc. It also meant that I was a constant target. Let me say that again. Because I wasn't popular and I was a little socially awkward, I was a constant target. There are only a couple of people that I would have pulled from a fire in that school. I would have just laughed as the others burned. Yes, it was completely wrong to think that way, but my hatred for them was palpable. Those conditions all led to a large amount of ignorance on my part. I knew only what my parents let me know, was told I was stupid and was a dumb motherfucker by their standards. Learning was wrong and punishable. Here's how that all read in the programming that was installed into me. Everyone knows more about everything than you do. If you open your mouth to speak the truth, it brings dire consequences. Everyone in any position you view higher than yours is smarter than you. Do not question them. The amount of people that like you is directly related to your intelligence. They only like you because you will not question them. You are a dumbass that knows nothing, and you will always be that way. Now, ain't that some dumb shit? Okay, so next let's talk about the trauma. The trauma that was installed into my programming was something I would never be able to overcome. When you experience something traumatic, it can leave scars on your soul. It forced me to add an additional step in my loop, and that's where I check my trauma against the situation. However, it is important for me to remind you that scars take time. Some people, like myself, will experience trauma and forever have an open wound. No amount of healing or therapy or forgiveness will ever close those wounds. Each and every person experiences and processes their trauma in different ways. I can only speak for myself. My trauma was a daily exercise in mental, physical, emotional, and verbal abuse. It came in the form of two people that sought to break down every drop of self-worth I had, and they could pummel me into submission. I was little more than a dog to them, and they reminded me of it every single second of my life. There are not enough episodes in this series to completely explain the level of trauma I went through. My trauma forced its way into my programming, and that code read like this. Fuck them all. 
none of them deserve to live. In my head, at that time, I was in an incredibly dark place. But that's what trauma does. It leaves people in dark places. Now, I want to say this before we go any further. If you're experiencing any kind of trauma, if you've experienced any kind of trauma and you are still in that incredibly dark place, get some help. There are lots of different options out there for you. You just have to be brave and Google. You're worth more than you can possibly imagine, and you're stronger than you will ever know. If you are in a dark place, get help. The next step in the loop is processing. This is a direct child of the perception portion of the loop. Think of it like this. If all you know is anger, then any info that comes into you will be run through the anger filter. If all you have is anger to process the problem with, that's all you'll get out of it. I was a bit screwed up because I not only had the aforementioned issues that my world was perceived through, but I also had a metric shit ton of anger. Like, heaps and heaps of anger. That meant that anything that came out of my mind was based on anger. There was no way to get around it. When I processed anything, it always went through the anger filter. Someone cutting in front of me? That was a reason for anger. Someone getting something more than me? Anger. Someone making a joke at my expense? That was also a reason for anger. In fact, I was so angry all the time that no one wanted to hang out with me. No one wanted to explain anything to me. No one wanted to work on any projects with me. No one wanted to be intimate with me. I was just a big ball of fucking anger all the time. And all that anger took its toll. And yes, it caught up with me. You see, the processing portion of the loop is very much like cooking. You can only cook with the ingredients that you have. If you have only ever cooked with a certain number of ingredients, you are dreadfully unaware of all the things you can make just by gathering different ingredients. It's kind of like a college kid that makes everything out of ramen. The sole basis for every meal is those crappy ramen noodles. No matter how you slice them up, they're still just ramen noodles. It's the same with anger, or depression, or even fake happiness. No matter which way you look at it, you're only going to get a certain kind of result over and over again if you keep using the same information to process anything that comes into you. Close to the end of this process is output. Remember, everything came in, it was processed, and then it went to output. As you may have figured out by now, each stage in the loop is dictated by what happens before it. I was processing everything with anger, so everything that came out of me was fundamentally based on anger. That meant that all of my outputs, everything I was putting out into the world, was hostile. All of my outputs were angry, fearful, ignorant, and just downright mean. At this point in my life, I had become exactly what my parents were grooming me to be. Just like them. The abused, that's me, had adopted the mindset and reaction-based lifestyle of my abusers. Now, how's that for a disappointing situation? Finally, we come to the reaction portion. Now, the reaction portion of my life was exactly what you thought it would be. I put anger out into the world, people reacted poorly to that anger, and I was completely incapable of understanding why they were reacting so negatively towards me. So what did I do? I stepped right back into the same loop that caused the problem in the first place. I didn't stay this way, though. Eventually, I came around to a few understandings and realizations that forced me to begin changing myself. Now, if you've made it through all of this previously, this is where you really want to start listening. As of the time of this podcast, I am 30 years separated from those that installed this poor code into me. I have a wonderful marriage and a fantastic family, a plethora of career choices at my fingertips. And for the most part, I am a happy human being. I'm in control of my emotions for the most part and how I process information. Ultimately, I'm able to control my output and my reaction to any given stimulus. Does this mean that I have achieved a perfect life? Absolutely not. Does this mean that I have healed from every single wound that was ever given to me? Honestly, no. But what has happened is that I'm able to control how I react and how I carry forward in my life when I am triggered. 
or when I need to make decisions that may be affected by my wounds, my trauma, or any lasting effects of that abuse-filled 15 years. I want to take what I have learned and give it to you. You are listening to this podcast for a reason. More than likely, you are currently struggling with something that has affected the way you live your life. Whether you're living in fear, anxiety, trauma, or you're just making poor decisions that are leading you to a ratchet lifestyle. I think it can help. Let's get started, shall we? Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you found this podcast helpful. Before we're finished with our time together, I want to remind you of a few things. You are not your trauma. You are so much more powerful than that trauma lets you believe. Heroes are often forged in the fires of hell. However, you will never escape the shackles keeping you here in this hell unless you stand up and become the hero you are meant to be. Once you make that decision to unleash your inner hero, you will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. I love you. Don't be afraid to love yourself. I'll meet you again in the next episode.